At the start of the Star Wars The Clone Wars film, Obi-Wan briefly talks with Anakin about getting a new Padawan. Ahsoka Tano initially appears to be this new Padawan, though it's soon revealed that she's actually been assigned to Anakin. The notion of Obi-Wan wanting a new Padawan is then dropped and it never resurfaces. But did Obi-Wan ever have another apprentice, not counting Luke Skywalker? You might be surprised to learn that the answer is yes. Obi-Wan trained two other apprentices, albeit for brief periods. In this video, we'll be telling their stories. Attention, Sergeant on deck! In an older video, we talked about how Obi-Wan once loved a fellow Jedi apprentice named Siri Tachi before the two made a mutual decision to put aside their feelings. Kenobi and Tachi remained close friends, however, and when they became Jedi Knights, they often worked alongside each other. Throughout their missions together, their Padawans Anakin Skywalker and Ferris Olin also became acquainted. However, Skywalker and Olin didn't exactly become friends. In fact, Skywalker harbored an intense jealousy for Tachi's apprentice. This jealousy was exacerbated when, in 24 BBY, the Jedi Council decided that Olin would be fast-tracked to the rank of Jedi Knight. To say that Anakin was pissed about this would be an understatement. It didn't help that Kenobi, Tachi, and their apprentices were all assigned to a mission to Korriban right after the Council announced Olin's forthcoming promotion. They were joined by two other Jedi and their apprentices. These Padawans, Darith Tanis and Truvelt, initially tried to befriend Skywalker and Olin, but distanced themselves from Skywalker after his bitterness became apparent. Veld was already acquainted with Skywalker before the mission to Korriban. In fact, Anakin had previously helped him repair his lightsaber. But when Veld's saber was damaged again on Korriban, he went to Ferris Olin instead of Anakin, still perturbed by the young Jedi's bitterness. As you'd expect, Anakin became even more bitter toward Olin over this perceived slight. As he watched Olin tinker with Veld's lightsaber, he chose not to tell Olin about the repairs he had made earlier, even though he knew they needed to be double checked for damage. This became a problem later in the mission when, during a fight in the Valley of the Dark Lords, Veld's lightsaber began to fail. Olin quickly swapped lightsabers with Veld as he believed it was his fault that the saber was shorting out, and then Veld's weapon stopped working altogether. Seeing that Olin was defenseless, Darithel Thanis charged in to help him, only to be shot and killed. Ferris Olin blamed himself for Thel Thanis' death, even when he learned that it was Anakin's repairs, not his, that had caused Veld's lightsaber to short out. In grief, Olin left the Jedi Order. After leaving the Order, Olin settled on Balassa, where he made some friends and started a business. However, when the Clone Wars broke out two years after the start of his self-imposed exile, Olin joined the fight. He signed on with the Grand Army of the Republic and fought as a recruited soldier, serving until the end of the war. When Order 66 was issued, Olin was spared, as the clones didn't consider him a Jedi, but he nonetheless deserted the army in disgust over the Republic's fall. But leaving the Imperial military behind wasn't enough for Olin. Back on Balassa, he started a small resistance group. The Empire, naturally, hunted the Balassan resistance, and Olin was eventually forced to take shelter in a remote mountain cabin. It was here that he received an unexpected visit from the last person he expected, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Kenobi helped Olin escape Balas and offered to train him as a Jedi again, an offer that Olin accepted. Kenobi reawakened the young man to the Force and helped him remember what he'd been taught as a Padawan. Olin quickly rediscovered the ways of the Force, and Kenobi sent his new apprentice on a mission to Ilum. On Ilum, Ferris Olin found Galen Muln, a former Jedi Master who had once been a good friend of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Olin helped Muln escape the planet, which the Empire had subjected to a strict quarantine. Olin, Muln, and Kenobi regrouped on a remote, uncharted asteroid that the Jedi had discovered nearby, which was capable of supporting life. It was decided that this asteroid would serve as a refuge for the Jedi who had escaped the Great Purge, and Kenobi tasked Olin with gathering as many Jedi as he could find. To Olin's frustration, however, Kenobi didn't plan on helping. He returned to Tatooine. Ferris Olin sought out many Jedi for the next year, some of whom he brought to the asteroid refuge. Unfortunately, the Empire destroyed the asteroid in 18 BBY, rendering Olin's hard work moot. He then went on numerous adventures after this, rendezvousing with Kenobi only occasionally. 
Eventually, he learned why his new master was so reclusive. He was guarding Luke Skywalker, who Kenobi believed could defeat the Sith and save the galaxy. Upon learning that Luke had a twin sister, Princess Leia Organa of Alderaan, Olin volunteered to watch over her, just as Kenobi was doing for Luke. He spent the dark times on Alderaan watching over Leia, and when she joined the Rebel Alliance, he set out to help her, though he kept his identity as a Jedi secret. Shortly after the Battle of Yavin, Olin finally met his end, and ironically enough, he was slain by none other than Darth Vader. Before Ferris Olin became Kenobi's apprentice, however, Obi-Wan took on another student, albeit for a very brief time. Said student was Halagard Ventor, a Padawan who had been close friends with Anakin Skywalker before he and his master were shot down while intervening in a civil war and presumed dead. A year after his presumed death, Ventor resurfaced and returned to Coruscant, albeit alone. His master really had been killed. As they sought a replacement master for the orphaned Padawan, the Jedi Council temporarily assigned Ventor to Obi-Wan Kenobi. Kenobi was still Anakin Skywalker's master at the time, but he was allowed to train Ventor simultaneously. Kenobi, Skywalker, and Ventor were only together for one mission, however. They traveled to the remote planet Sky, which had been conquered by the Separatist Align rogue Genesis Zeta Magnus. During the mission, Skywalker and Ventor engaged in a Jedi tradition called the Concordance of Fealty, swapping lightsabers as a show of trust. Together, Skywalker and Ventor convinced the native clans of Sky into rebelling against Magnus before moving on to arrest the mad geneticist and destroy his project. The mission was ultimately a success. In a brief burst of anger, Ventor killed Zeta Magnus himself. After the mission was completed, Kenobi confronted Ventor about his brush with the dark side. When Ventor defended his actions, it sparked an argument with Anakin Skywalker. Both Padawans were tired from the battle, and their exhaustion kindled their annoyance into open hostility. A fight nearly broke out between the two men, after which they bitterly ended the Concordance of Fealty. Upon returning to Coruscant, Ventor was reassigned. He became a Jedi Knight not long after the Battle of Sky, as did Anakin. As a quick bit of trivia, Halagard Ventor's role in the Battle of Sky was actually one big retcon. You see, the story of the battle was first told in a 1977 Expanded Universe comic in which the natives of Sky briefly mention it to Luke Skywalker. They tell Luke that their planet was saved during the Clone Wars by Obi-Wan Kenobi and his two apprentices, one of whom had the surname Skywalker. They later identify the two apprentices as Skywalker and Darth Vader, as this comic was written before it was revealed that the two were one and the same. However, the first apprentice is never directly identified as Anakin Skywalker in the comic, rather, he is just referred to as the former bearer of Luke's lightsaber, since Anakin's first name wasn't established back then and the writers had to work around it. Thus, the writers of later expanded universe works inserted Halagard Ventor into the story in a rather cunning retcon, using the already established concept of the Concordance of Fealty to align the story with the original comic. Due to the comic's wording, the two stories are technically fully compatible, even if the writers had to jump through hoops to get them to that point. Continuity is fun, isn't it? Well, that's today's dose of extraordinarily obscure Legends lore. We've got plenty more where that came from, but what do you think? Would you like to see more about either of these stories? Feel free to post your thoughts in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.